Um, as my children will tell you, I'm a rule follower. And I was told as a moderator, I do not have a formal speaking role. I'm going to begin the session by telling you this is panel number four on Friday, teaching better studies. The presenters are going to introduce themselves, and I will keep them on time. So we were supposed to have three presenters for this panel. Inga, regrettably, is not able to be here due to a family emergency. So I will keep our presenters somewhat on time. And maybe the next panel, hint, hint, could start a little early since people are flagging. So with that, I will turn it over to the presenters. You're up, Amanda. Good luck. Nobody's flagging. We're doing fine. about the intercollegiate collaboration of veteran studies and the Student Occupational Science Association. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to ask, I'm bad at uh, you know, moving around and talking instead of sitting still, <laughs> but um, when I say the word occupation or occupations, what does everyone think about? In the West. Yeah. Activities Jobs. of daily living. Mm -hmm. Jobs. Jobs. You, get a, you get a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times when people think of occupations, you know, they think they think of their jobs, um, but really, <laughs> but really, when you think of when occupations are um, everything you do in a day daily, um, whether that be brush your teeth, drive into work. Um, just everything that encompasses your daily life. Um, leisure, leisure participation, um, doing some kind of play activity, anything, is your occupations. So um, to start my presentation off, I thought I would talk a little bit about what is occupational therapy and what is occupational science. Um, according to uh, Merriam-Webster, occupational therapy is therapy based on engagement in meaningful activities of daily life such as self-care skills, education, work, or social interaction, especially to enable or encourage participation in such activities despite impairments or limitations in physical or mental functioning. Um, and then the occupational science is kind of like the science behind of occupational therapy. Um, according to EKU, occupational science is the study of human occupation, how we occupy our time through activity, organ organize ourselves by activity patterns and habits, and create meaning through occupation. Occupational is, is essential to healthy and satisfying life. Occupational science is an evolving so social science that studies occupation, how and why people engage in occupations, the context in which occupations occur, and the occupational performance that results. So my uh, presentation kind of started off um, I mentioned that I, I, I am a certified occupational therapy assistant, um, and then I have also finished my uh, bachelor's in occupational science this past uh, spring. So with that, as I was in the occupational science um, program, I was in the Student Occupational Science Association, and I, I also uh, received my um, certificate in veteran studies. <laughs> And so I kind of stumbled upon veteran studies like they gave us a list of like um, if you want to choose an elective here's a list of an electives and just choose whatever you want to do. So I was like I saw an elective for veteran studies so I kind of was like well let's just check this out. And so uh, I took one class and I was hooked. Um, I had amazing professors uh, Dr. Martin and Do Dr. Barris. <laughs> yes. Uh, regrettably, Dr. Martin was not able to be here today, but um, so uh, I've learned so much from both of them, and then I've also talked to our um, historian, veteran studies historian, Clay Howard, um, so all of them have really helped me throughout my uh, veteran studies and learning about um, what veterans 
what the veteran culture is like and everything um, about veterans. Um, but this program, this protocol I've developed started as a member of the Student Occupational Science Association. The mission of the Student Occupational Science Association is to support students in the Occupational Science Program at Eastern Kentucky University. SOSA promotes scholarship, social interaction, and service in the community and among its members. And that's a lovely picture that was taken last spring of all of us. So um, I've been asked this question a lot of times, what does uh, occupational therapy have to do with veterans and vice versa? Um, a lot of people assume that I'm a veteran because I have a veteran study certificate. Um, and when I tell them I, I'm not, they're like, well, what's, what's the point? And so um, you don't have to you know, be a veteran to want to learn about the culture you know, with the occupational therapy, uh, therapists help veterans all the time um, through a l bunch of things that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, the Veterans Health Administration um, employs OTs and OTAs pr that provide state-of-the-art and evidence-based care to veterans and service members. Occupational therapy provide services that promote health and wellness to veterans who have or are at risk for developing an injury, disease, or condition spanning physical, cognitive, sensory, and psychosocial domains. O OT evaluation and treatment supports a veteran's engagement in everyday life activities that affect their physical and mental health and well-being. And these therapists work in a variety of settings, you know, outpatient, inpatient, community living, Veterans Homes, Taylor Rehabilitation, which has been a really big avenue since the pandemic with um, doing Taylor Rehab Rehabilitation. Um, being able to do that has been great for individuals that are, that are unable to or would rather not get out while everything was going on. This is just a list of um, specialties that OTs can provide. It's not all encompasses. Um, but OTs do provide a, a load of specialties. A lot of times I feel like when you th talk about occupational therapy and occupational therapist, um, individuals don't really know what all OTs do. There is so many avenues that you can work with or help with, um, and this is just a, a few of them that you can either get specialties in or by um, learning more about it, you can provide these services. Okay. As a um, occupational therapy practitioner, a lot of OTs um, have kind of a frame of reference that kind of like molds how they think about things and how they go through their, the clinic or wherever they work and kind of think about when you think about um, your clients and how they move, how they work, how they think. Um, for me, the uh, model that I kind of, is just kind of like my model I've researched a lot about and that I feel most comfortable with is uh, the model of human occupation. Um, with MOHO, uh, it's an occupation-based, evidence-based, client-centered approach to OT practice, which includes vol volition, habituation, and performance capacity. Volition, which is the process where people are motivated and choose what activities they do, and pers which includes personal causation, values and interest. It's kind of like, why are people mo motivated to do what they love to do? Um, then there's habituation, where people organize their actions into patterns and routines, which are like the habits and roles, and what the individual does on a daily basis. And then there's the performance capacity, which is the underlying mental and physical abilities and how they are used and experienced in occupational performance. So what are the implications? Um, as we collaborate with professors and professionals of various disciplines, uh, we enhance our learning and understanding. As emerging professionals in the occupational science program, it is important to practice interviewing skills as this will help us in our professional life. The 
veterans population is one population that is prevalent in various areas, so it is imperative that we understand veteran culture and this project uh, will increase learning and understanding on the veteran population. Uh, this project uses MOHO approach in the veteran population, it is important to understand the various occupations they participate in and what may motivates them to engage in these occupations. So with my project, what I did was I, at going through the veteran studies program, I thought more, you know, more people needs to learn about this culture. I've learned, I've listened to and learned so many misconceptions and things that even my own misconceptions before I started the program um, that you know everyone kind of has with the veterans and what what they do, who they are. And so with this program, I wanted to see if I could get more people to understand veteran culture. Um, I know earlier we talked about cultural competence, and that's kind of a word that we use a lot of in school, in class and stuff with our occupational therapy classes, because what we want to do, you know, in order to build rapport and to help uh, clients as much as we can, we can, um, we want to, you know, um, help kind of help more individuals um, develop that cultural competence. So my idea was, if I could um, develop this protocol that uses the Student Occupational Science Association and which I'm still currently working with them, even though I'm not a member anymore, um, to help them, uh, to give them like, set up these interviews and help them go through the process of interviewing these veterans to uh, be able to donate these oral histories to the William H. Berg Oral History Center, which is our center on campus where we um, keep some of the oral histories that we have on veterans. And so I want to help these individuals develop this cultural competence with veterans and, um, and through interviews. And so um, with this protocol, I feel like it would uh, bring a greater understanding of the veteran population. It will also enhance professionalism by providing the resources required to increase interviewing skills, which also will lead to building, helping to build rapport. Um, this emphasizes the importance of intercollegiate collaboration, as I've collaborated with um, Veteran Studies, Occupational Science, and the EKU uh, Crab Library to develop this project. These interviews are also gonna be donated to the William H. Burke Oral History Center to benefit future students. Um, with the uh, William H. Burke Oral History Center, which, um, you know, a lot of times I feel like with veterans or anyone really, um, it, once, you know, they pass away or anything, if we don't have those oral histories, how can we learn? So that was a big thing in my project, like getting those oral histories to benefit, you know, not the just the people I'm collaborating with right now, but for future use, for future students, after, you know, I'm not at EKU anymore, or um, just future students will be able to go back and watch these interviews and learn from a culture that they are not uh, culturally comp competent with yet. Um, so that was my project. Uh, I really enjoyed doing, and I have really learned a lot from interviewing and uh, speaking with my professors about veterans and um, developing the project. Yes, do, you mind, do you mind staying up there, Anna, just for the microphone? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> this one? Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna ask Amanda to stay up there because we're short on microphones right now. Um, but we've got some time, so before our next speaker goes, I'll go ahead and field questions uh, Eric Hodges, uh, how many um, oral histories did you guys collect for your project? Um, right now, I've collected uh, two myself. Um, I'm still currently working with them. You know, COVID kind of affected everything, and I found that after you know we came back in person, I had a, a really hard time finding volunteers 
that would um, help me with my endeavor. So I'm hoping that now that everything's starting to be in, in person now, I'm still working with them, that I will develop a protocol where that will require um, SOSA members to collect one uh, oral history a semester. Are you thinking about um, looking at different generations of veterans? Viet I mean, you know, Vietnam veterans are dying off of 500 a day now, yeah. unfortunately. So uh, that could, if you could find Vietnam vets, I think that'd be great. Yeah, uh, I'm hoping to get like um, different, you know, different wars, but um, it just kind of depends if, you know, who knows who, if I can find the veteran to interview. Um, I have a couple lined up. I don't quite remember off the top of my head what war they are a veteran of, but um, I think that would be very interesting. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate the, the work from an occupational perspective. As you were going through this process of uh, connecting veteran issues and, and occupational issues, what other disciplines did you discover are, are important? Uh, because we, you know, in full disclosure at Colorado State, we're trying to, to figure out the best way to approach a, a strategy for developing a, a veteran studies program of our own, which uh, Ben Schrader here, it was his uh, proposal that you know we're trying to get everybody on board with. And uh, so we want to make sure we're looking at all the disciplines that are applicable. Uh, what insights could you share on that? I, uh, I think uh, all the health sciences would benefit, um, you know, and being in, within health sciences, um, you know, you're going to come across veterans and really to build that rapport, which is, you know, if you're going to be like a good practitioner, whichever field you choose, like I've talked to nurses, I've talked to PTs. Um, we don't have a PT program, but I know some PTs that I've talked to and then uh, SLPs and um, trying to just get in that, in, that uh, collaboration, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, you know, uh, collaboration to learn about veterans and build that rapport that's really I feel like helps the veterans more than um, just saying you know you're here you know this is your problem let's just fix it instead of like really getting to know them and building that rapport um, I think that really like benefits you know the veterans that are coming into our clinics and um, as we work together Uh, we actually uh, do yes. have animal yes. assisted therapy and I love animals so I would love to use dogs uh, we do have a, co a professor that is certified in animal assisted therapy and has brought a dog into class before <laughs> It is occupational therapy. Uh, I just occupy, I just said, wanted to clarify occupations because a lot of people think of, you know, when you say occupation, um, everyone wants to think of job. And as an occupational therapist, there is so much that we can work with um, from, you know, getting ready in the morning to helping you navigate community transport to pretty much just anything from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, um, even when you're when you're in bed because we can also work with sleep and um, just anything you do uh, an occupational therapist can help with so I'm, I'm hearing you say occupation therapy and occupational therapy is the same thing yes okay. we have time for maybe one more question Am I allowed to stay? I don't have slides, so am I allowed to stay yeah. sitting? Or do I have to stand? Up? Do I need to be over here? For Are the you standing now? I was. <laughs> oh, this, is this is. I never heard that one before. All right, so I, I, I'll stand at the microphone. So um, let me. That's the one that's
supposed to be up? Yeah. I don't know how to do that. Just go though. to slides mode. Just click slides mode. Oh, I see it. All right. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm a little um, nervous because my partner who I was working on this, Dr. Travis Martin, uh, is not here. And, uh, and so I've redesigned the program. So what we intended to do was do kind of a workshop on building your first veteran studies program. Uh, what I'm going to do is do a survey of current veteran studies programs, which may be helpful, and then, uh, and then workshop a little bit um, maybe for CSU on how to find a champion on campus and those type of things. But also, uh, in, in the world of super interesting, uh, your program is in this paper right here because it's fantastic. I, I have done research on ungrading to help yeah. Dr. Martin yeah. with our program. So uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, my name is Jim Craig. I'm the coordinator of the Veteran Studies Program at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. I've been there since 2013. Uh, I taught my first Veteran Studies course, which I called Veterans in American Society in 2014, um, after finding what was going on at EKU and um, what was going on at Virginia Tech and thinking we needed another oil spot somewhere in the Midwest to try to grow this thing until they join. Um, so uh, the program is called Designing and Teaching Your First Veteran Studies Course, but really what I'm gonna do is just survey some Veteran Studies courses that are happening right now. Uh, about 10 years ago, Travis Martin, I think, built the first Veteran Studies program of this generation. And I say that because it is clear people studied veterans before this generation. Um, and, uh, and it's still there and actually really strong at EKU. So, but it does seem like a good time to review where we are. Um, my, so I've been teaching since 2014. My graduate work is in history and public policy. So my veteran studies course has generally been focused around public policy, really, and then a little bit of history built in there until I got assigned into a sociology department. Uh, and then I had to figure out how to do sociology in this. And to be fair, it's not a bad fit in a sociology department. So we've started to add concepts like institutions and labeling and symbolic interactionism into my courses. And I think, uh, I think it's for the better. Uh, my current course has not been a rousing success. I hate to say this, but it is true. But when I offer it, it makes. I get 12, I get 15. Based on how things are going, sometimes I get 25. I rarely get two or three and get canceled. So I think that's a win. Um, and like you, I get a student or two after every class who becomes a veteran studies minor uh, because they stumbled into it. So here's the quick structure of my talk. I'll review the courses I surveyed. I will talk about some commonalities in the courses. I'll talk about some areas where uh, I find a difference between the courses and then find that interesting. I'm going to highlight a couple of interesting readings or projects in these courses. You're in it. Uh, and then some lessons that I've learned over the last 10 years about creating and teaching the course um, and, and what that might look like. So getting started. I surveyed, and this was a quick survey, seven courses from three different institutions, EKU, University of Missouri, St. Louis, uh, University of California, Irvine. I did not get a hold of ASUs uh, or St. Leo or uh, Virginia Tech is teaching a course that's similar to a veteran, could be considered a veteran studies course. Um, but that's just based on time. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Uh, what I generally saw were courses in the lower division, 1,000 and 2,000 level courses, although there was an upper division course. I did not review capstone courses because most of those courses that I saw were project-based. Um, apply what you learned over the last two, two years or whatever. And it was in my capstone. Yours was in the capstone? Oh, well, I, have, I found it in another. Oh, hold on. Right. Uh, I also uh, I didn't review courses from graduate programs that are specifically veteran services. So if you know SUNY Empire teaches a, a graduate program in veteran services, which is, has by all accounts been very successful and the VA is very happy with it because they hire people out of that program. Uh, I'm not convinced that's a veteran studies. I think that's just something different. The courses, six of them were fully online. Only one of them was in person. 
and the time range of the course was like a five week or four week summer course all the way up to a full 16 week in class lecture type course uh, and most of them were around eight weeks or a half semester or, or like a quarter type course. Uh, the most prevalent commonality I found is early and often grappling with this question, what makes a veteran, which is what we are doing right here. And as far as I can tell from the syllabi, uh, instructors don't let students off easy. There isn't an answer to that question that's presented at the beginning of a course. And often the question is asked again at the end of the course. Um, and some readings and just a few readings that I pulled uh, range from Title 38, public law that identifies what a veteran is, and I'll share that with you in a second. Willard Waller is out there and still used. Uh, and then there are some several writers in current public discourse who talk about veterans and what is a veteran. Rebecca Burgess does a lot of work on this. If you don't know her, Phil Cly and Roy Scranton argue in public discourse with each other about this regularly. Um, and so I'm gonna just take a quick side note. Title 38 will tell you the, and this is a quote, the term veteran, and the quotes are actually in public law, veteran, means a person who served in the active military, naval, air, or space services, and who was discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than dishonorable. Which is a very interesting term because there's no discharge called other than dishonorable. Right? And so this creates uh, conundrums in public policy. Um, another commonality I found in the field of veteran studies was, and I'm not trying to toot, is, is people read my article from 2016 called Bounding Veteran <laughs> Studies. So uh, it makes me proud, but I think it's because people are really trying to get their head around what is this thing. And, and it's the same question that you guys asked in the back, is it a public policy program? Is it a history program? Is it a humanities program? Is it a business program? Is it trauma studies? I don't know, right? And so their struggle with that. Uh, other articles, clearly uh, references out of the Journal of, of Veteran Studies are included in those readings and specifically mentioned on a couple is a work by Len Lira at Santa Clara University in the JVS who wrote uh, a, a, a literature review essentially of what people are doing in that. By the way, he's my battle buddy from Iraq. Um, Another commonality I found was challenging students to think differently about how well our veterans are supported or not supported in our society. And what are our obligations related to this group, if any. Courses address this topic in various ways. The most common method was using different demographics, the intersectionality around our veterans, including gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, citizen status, and others. Another way courses uh, address this was focusing on what Alex Horton called the pedestal problem. This idea that if you put a person on a pedestal, your view of that person is skewed, but also that person's view of you is skewed inherently. And, um, and then the last example of that comes straight out of UC Irvine's course. In the opening, it says, students will gain a deep awareness and appreciation of the varied experiences of an American community that is simultaneously underrepresented, underserved, and hyper-visible. Uh, the last commonality I wanna highlight, and we're on it already, is thanks for your service. There isn't a course out there that doesn't spend at least one class somewhere on this idea about thanks for your service, unpacking that. Uh, and a little personal note, I think you can unpack all three of the key words in there. That you can unpack the thanks you can unpack the service, and you can unpack yours, all three of those, and I think you could spend some time on each one of those. Um, how about differences? So uh, I think the differences usually are indicative of disciplinary or faculty expertise. And just like, how do you come at the problem? So I don't think those are problematic. Uh, I think they're interesting, but I do wanna highlight three areas of note that I thought uh, missing, really. Uh, only one of the three course of the seven courses actually required a student to engage with a veteran. EKU's course and require students to do a oral history or interview a veteran. Um, 
students uh, have to listen to a veteran story. I, I personally find that project super interesting, but I wonder if maybe it's because we have moved and the pandemic has had something to do with that and we've moved online and that becomes a little more complicated. Uh, and maybe the fact that some of these courses are short, five weeks, eight weeks, that actually having to develop a strategy for an oral history interview and then first of all learn how to do that and how to do that well and then follow up and then if you're going to try to submit it to an actual library um, maybe you just don't have enough time to get it that's a tough task uh, only two courses used fiction to address veterans um, and uh, as a source of knowledge or insight uci's course and mayor teaches it uh, called veteran voices is clearly a veteran studies course now, it is an upper division course. It's a writing course using, uh, the, using veterans and veterans writing and writing about veterans to help students become better writers, but that's clearly a veteran studies course. Uh, the other one is the UMSOL's course, Veterans in American Society, which uses post-9-11 veterans authors and asks students to explore concepts from earlier in the semester, later in the semester, by reading fiction by our veteran authors. Um, and another little side note, I'm a little biased here, but I think the business of veteran literature is super duper interesting. And who gets to speak for veterans in the, in the fiction, in the literature of our society is a very interesting question. Um, so check out Pete Moline's blog if you're interested in, in that. Uh, lastly, I was surprised that only two courses discussed military or veteran memorialization. So in both cases, those blocks started with something with Maya Lin and the Veterans Memorial and, and how that came about. And there are lots of good um, TED Talk style videos you can watch. And there's nice uh, National Geographic work around the struggle around the Veteran Memorial. Um, uh, but other readings include uh, Kurt Peeler's book, Remembering War the American Way and uh, also magazine and journal articles, a little more accessible. So uh, I want to highlight three things that make me want to fix my course. So the first is the oral history project in AKU's, EKU's class. Uh, what a fantastic way to take what you're trying to learn in an academic sense and apply it to a human being, which is what we are talking about here. Uh, also, to add value for future researchers. So I'm excited about that, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to fit what's got to go to get that in. Um, UCI's work um, is deliberate and very clear that they're working on intersectionality of veterans and the veteran experience. Uh, the course Veterans in History and Society spends more time than any other course, and really more time than any other working through different social groups of veterans than, uh, than any course I've realized. And I think... The insights that you could gain by doing that are both profound and, uh, and really important, and uh, that's really where I want to take my class. Uh, the last two was things that I want to fix are those programs that ask students to actually engage in some sort of advocacy or public policy work. Now, we are not an advocacy program per se, but clearly we have a foot in advocacy. Uh, so. Some ideas that I saw were policy recommendations, memos. Uh, one course asks students to write an op-ed for publishing in the local paper or the student paper about a topic that they learned and researched. Uh, it really is a way to connect the academic work to changing your society for the better. Um, so now I want to just take five minutes or so to talk through my personal thoughts about how to create one of these courses, and I'm going to highlight a few things. One, you, you got to understand the purpose, you got to figure out your structure, um, and then you have to work on who is your champion. And so starting with purpose, this is not to say uh, in, in any way to disparage anybody, but you got to figure out if it's a scholarship project or a vanity project. <laughs> you do, right? And um, there are a lot of universities and a lot of programs that are vanity programs, and when that person leaves, there's nothing left. And you may have advanced the ball a couple of yards, but you haven't made any major gains. So it's a tough question. So I think in order to do that, you need to link your work to general education. 
or to a specific discipline, one of those two. Uh, the problem is vet studies is inherently interdisciplinary. So I think you're stuck at gen ed. Uh, and you're stuck at interdisciplinary gen ed. And you need to figure out how this can be taught by someone other than you, whoever that is. And, and can it be taught by someone who's not a veteran? And if it can't, it's probably not designed well enough yet. Your structure, um, online, in-person, eight weeks, 16 weeks, seminar, self-paced, all sorts of options. To me, this work lends itself to the in-person seminar style course. But at my institution, that's not where my students are. My students are now online and we are scrambling to maintain our enrollments and we have to be where, we have to meet them where they are. So right now we're doing eight week online asynchronous. Uh, I, you need, I think at some stage you need to be willing to ad adjust your program objectives or your course objectives for that. You, the same course in a 16 week seminar where we sit around and think and write and read is a different course than an online asynchronous uh, discussion board based course. Um, textbook, is there a textbook? Anyone want to work with me on that? <laughs> Mayor does. Yeah, there is no textbook. But let me highlight a couple of texts that, that have been used. Uh, Jim Wright's Those Who Have Borne the Battle is a book out of 2012 or 2013, which is a great history of our veterans up until 2012, 2013. So we, it's missing 10 years of work, but it's really an excellent work. Uh, Lewis Hicks. Uh, produced a two-volume edited work called The Civilian Lives of U.S. Veterans just in 2017, probably. It's hardcover. It's super expensive. Uh, maybe you should have it on your shelf and make... You didn't hear me say make... I can't say, I can't say that. Never mind. Um, uh, but it's excellent. It's also... Uh, it's social work kind of focused because his co-editor was a social worker. Uh, so it's a sociologist and a social worker, but but the ideas that are presented in there are really good. Um, there is a book out there called The Encyclopedia of the, U of the Veteran in America, William Pensack's book. It's, it's problematic. Yeah, it's really brilliant. It's really problematic. They kind of whitewash a lot. But it also identifies things that you could be thinking about because someone, someone sat down and wrote down all the stuff that you need to talk about with veterans, which isn't a good project to do. Um, UMass Press has a veteran series. Uh, it's getting better and better every time a new book comes out. And I think they have maybe four books out. Uh, it, it's not a textbook, but the, the work that they're doing is very good. And I cannot uh, uh, not mention that the Journal of Veteran Studies might be your textbook, <laughs> right? Pieces of the journal, parts of the journal, it's free, it's open source, collect what you want, put it in a book form and hand it to your students. Uh, it's really good. The last thing, and I think I'm getting the hook soon, who's your champion? This is the hardest part for a course, maybe not. Sometimes you get a dean and they let you offer a course and if it makes, they're like, ah, do it again. But if you want a program, you have to find somebody who wants to help you advance this. Um, it, maybe it's General Frankly. Maybe he can help in another place, because clearly he's pushing someone somewhere around here, right? Uh, so a, a dean is a good one, maybe the perfect one, if you can find a dean, because a dean in a college can make things happen. A chancellor is good, a provost is good, a vice president is good, but they're a little removed from the actual teaching. They're better at getting the funding or the pressure. Um, so you got to find a champion, and it's going to take a while, usually. And you, and you got to find where the department sits. So now you have to have a department because things don't exist. Things exist for a short amount of time in a vacuum on campuses, but then without the structures of funding and courses and scheduling and staff support, they go away. Um, I used to have a department and now I don't. Now I'm in the sociology department, right? Uh, and then the last questions uh, are really how do you sell it? What happens in the first time when it doesn't make like, do you have enough uh, institutional credit that you've built that you can take a little bit of a loss until this thing grows? Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to highlight a small project that 
uh, Travis and I and, and Anita and Luke McLeese were working on, and it's still out there, but this is this idea of a National Center for Excellence in Veteran Studies. So we're trying to build this organization of higher education professionals who literally exist to help you build these programs. So we will uh, engage with you. We, we haven't done it yet, right? But we will engage with you. We can uh, present to your administration something that looks akin to disciplinary structure to say, no, this is a thing. And, uh, and we're, we're there to help for that. So don't hesitate to reach out to the Veteran Studies Association leadership or, or me or any of the scholars who are actually working on this right now because that's really where we want to take this thing. And, um, and I think that's all I have. So thank you for your time. So uh, I will take that, but I'm, I, you can take part of this too because you found a course. Um, I think start with the advisors, critical, right? And um, so you have to spend, can I hear, are you all right? Yeah, so you have to spend time uh, like publishing your course, meeting with people about your course, thinking about your program, if there's a program, what comes next, reminding them that uh, it's not just for veterans, and I think that's a good, I don't know, I, I could go back and look at the courses that I have. In, on the syllabi, it often says, you know, yeah, we, we invite and we're excited about veterans and non-veterans in the classroom, but I don't know that it's in the course description. And uh, that may be a smart change to remind that people and to uh, tell people veteran studies it isn't just for veterans. In fact, the majority of our campus is not veterans, so. Uh, and you found one, right? Yeah. So. Well, you, can, uh, you can also suggest students for students. You have student dependents also that are technically civilians, but they're from the veteran yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And I know at Pet Tillman, we have a ton of uh, veterans that are from the veteran world. And I know some of them have joined our classes and stuff. So also work with your veteran centers and have that because they, that's where they go also because they get their benefits from there. So you can also promote it in your veteran centers for veterans and student dependents. Yeah, I know in our course it didn't like specify that uh, you could take this even though you know you're not a veteran. Um, it was just kind of like said in introduction to veteran studies, and um, that was the first course that I found. But a lot of your like um, college of health sciences have different advisors than everyone else. So I think what really helped was that we were provided a list of electives, and veteran studies was on that list, which was very beneficial. But was it electives for a specific outcome, or was it just free electives? Uh, uh, free electives. So. Hi, William Howe. Um, right here. Yeah, question for you. Uh, you so, um, I'm, I'm a communication scholar, and yeah. uh, in our National Communication Association, two years ago, they started the uh, communication in the military division. So yeah. it's a subdivision of the, uh, of the national organization. Already has over 300 members. And through that, uh, I've gotten ref six referrals so far from uh, master's or PhD students uh, for directed readings. 
and I've had two undergrads do directed readings, yeah. but I'm, now I'm kind of wanting to take the next step to do a course like what you're suggesting. My question is, I have the option of either doing it as an organizational communication special topic and doing it like a special topic uh, communication in veterans, mm -hmm. or doing it, like getting it approved as an official course for the catalog. I was wondering what you may recommend there. So we, um, you know, my experience was we started as a special topic course, and when it made twice, I went back and said, look, this course makes, we need to get a number on it, a real number on it. Um, but the struggle with a special topics course is that it, it some student in humanities is not going to find your course because it's just called COM325 or something like that, and so they wouldn't even think or they'll see special topics, but they don't read the next line, which says the title of the special topics. Uh, so uh, you have to sell a couple of times to get it, and then, um, and then I, th the processes on my campus are once you've proven the course makes a couple of times, they'll getting the approval through curriculum and instruction is pretty straightforward, um, and we can run a special topics on. You know, we don't need dean's approval or any of that. You just run it. The other thing I want to say is this is a really, like, directed readings, independent studies is a fantastic way to connect to students in this field. And then um, not only do you provide them a service by letting them research something that they're very interested in, you connect them to the field and maybe they follow up. And uh, something I do fairly regularly with veteran students on my campus who need some hours um, if they're a minor in veteran studies, then uh, directed readings in veteran studies is part of their program. And if you need three more hours to get full time, let's do a directed readings. I've got a bookshelf full that I need someone to read for me and write a literature review. And so we do that fairly regularly. And it's, it's, a, it's a service, really, for veterans to keep their full time status sometimes. But it does help connect people into the field. <laughs> I have a yeah. quick question. You started teaching in 2013, mm -hmm. right? and a lot of veterans were were um, coming into colleges at that time. And now, not so much. Yeah. Every five students, yeah. only one is in the military at the moment. There, there are no veterans at all. Yeah. So, my question is: um, um, in, in 2013, what were your what did your students think veteran studies was going to be about? What did they think they were learning, and, and what for? And then the second mm -hmm. part of the question is. Um, what about now? Has there been any change? Um, uh, that's it. Howard, that's a great question. Uh, in 2013, my veteran students thought I was going to give them three hours and let them not do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a, we actually, we named it in our vet center the veteran entitlement syndrome. <laughs> uh, they did. They, they had been told for the last 10 years of their careers that they didn't, that life on the civilian world was super easy and they wouldn't have to work because their service will grant them all sorts of things and they thought they were going to come into my class and we were just going to tell war stories you're, to each other. You're talking about students who are veterans. Yes, students who are veterans. Um, what they got was uh, students who are veterans in the same classroom with students who are non-veterans and um, and uh, uh, just some tough conversations about their service and what, what our obligations are to them or not. Um, now I get family members uh, and I get people who are interested in understanding. I don't get, I, I still get veterans, but I'm about 50-50. Um, people who are interested in working in this field, social work students, communication students, um, sociology students who um, think it might be valuable for their career, like trans in in a transactional way. I need to learn this because this certification will will get me somewhere, uh, and that's okay. Um, in fact, that's how, at a public state university. That's kind of how we sell the education anyway. So, um, yeah, I'll let you manage that. Yeah, yeah. that's my job. Right. I'm not inside. <laughs> Hi, this is a question for both of you. Um, so you mentioned kind of the idea of doing that oral history project with veterans, and I think it was uh, Dr. Krauss-Borello who mentioned uh, to caution against 
feeling entitled to veteran story, and particularly when you're teaching a class of undergraduates so many things that go wrong, telling them to go out and do mm -hmm. human subject research. So how do you think it would be an appropriate way to kind of navigate the ethics of integrating that into a That's a good question. You go for it. <laughs> well, uh, we have all, we have several different documents we have to complete to be able to do an oral history. Um, you know, we have to, you know, we have to get tape release, we have to, you know, um, first we have to make our questions, we have to get our questions approved, and there's a, there was a long process to, you know, before you had, before you got the okay to do the oral history um, the first time. Um, and if it was, if you were doing like research research, you would have to get an IRB approval, so we couldn't, you know, do the, do, you know, research research. We could just do the oral histories. Yeah, I think the distinction there is that oral history yeah. and human subjects research are actually two separate things. Yeah. Yeah. That is, doing an oral history does not necessarily mean that you need to complete an IRB and do the same kind of like city training right. for human subjects research um, because the sort of ethical practices that underlie both of those things are a little bit distinct. But, but it is, I, I get what you're saying. This is, uh, my students, even a veteran studies student, doesn't have a right to other people's stories. And so to send them out, I haven't done this yet, by the way, I have to figure this out, but to send, send them out and say, go find a veteran and interview a veteran, um, without proper preparation and understanding, uh, I, I gotta work, work on that. But yeah. oral histories are voluntary. They, they are, like right, so are clearly they're gonna volunteer, yeah. It's different than it is. being in a clinical situation yes. and having a therapist ask you to tell yeah. you your yeah. story. Well, we, we have the, uh, I probably have a lot of the voice. You do. You're good. <laughs> um, where we have the William H. Burke Oral History Center, like through that center, we have, you know, um, they have to, you know, sign the release for their oral histories to be used and be able to be put in that our archives for future use. Yeah. So we have to get all the paperwork online. <laughs> so, uh, and and on our campus, we partner with an organization called Missouri Veterans History Project, which is producing uh, recording oral histories of veterans in the state of Missouri for not only Missouri Historical Society but for the Library of Congress. So the Veterans Voices Initiative which can help understand how to do these things and what's available. I mean literally you can do veteran voices with a phone and your you know your grandmother you know, like right now and it's not a you just have to make sure they say their name and say they're a lot they want they support it and then they'll put that sucker in the Library of Congress and um, it's available for the future to learn, uh, so it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I did my my interview was actually a phone interview. When my first one, because we were going through uh, COVID and we weren't really able to be in person, so yeah. my first interview was actually a phone interview. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bill Amber. Uh, right now, I um, live on the campus of ASU. I'm a volunteer there. I'm an educator, I've been a professor, and I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. And it's from that perspective, and, and not in any way representing ASU, that I would ask these questions about the program. Uh, one, uh, how would the, will the program be evaluated as successful or unsuccessful? Yeah. Two, uh, will there, what will the research requirement be? It seems to me we did not touch that. Third. Uh, everyone is going to ask you how how is placement going to work? Will our people get jobs? And if so, do we need to do something to help get them trained up in that area? So those are just three thoughts that I've had in addition to some of the comments, some of the many comments that have been really good ones here. It's an excellent point, um, and that's the language of provosts and um, deans. Um, this is, you know, maybe still in dispute. I'm not convinced that veteran studies is there as a major yet. Um, I, I don't know that we have the theory, uh, we don't have the disciplinary work, we don't have the researchers to, to, and the descriptions about how we are, uh, um, I, how we are a fully fledged major discipline yet. Uh, so my course is, mine is a minor, um, some are certificates, 
And I, in my sense, and on my campus, this difference between a certificate and a minor really is some sort of uh, acceptance in the external world for, uh, you know, that piece of paper means I have done something and therefore I, I have these credential, it's a credentialing thing. Plus, you don't have to be a degree-seeking student to be a certificate-seeking student, so you could pull those. That's one way to think about it. Um, in terms of research, uh, this is a tough one because of the disciplinary structure of academics. And um, I'm excited to hear that ASU is pulling in two new faculty members to their program. But if, if I heard right, they're teaching faculty, not research faculty, um, which again, where do our PhDs go? And this is a yeah, good question. They're likely to be both. Yeah. So on my camp, I'm teaching faculty. I don't have, I am never, I'm not evaluated on my research. Um, I literally am not supposed to put it on my CV. Um, but my research informs my teaching, so it just stays. Thanks. This is looping back a little bit. I, oh. I did want to pick up on your recommendation of the um, Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. For anybody who's looking for resources, there's also the Oral History Association. Yeah. Um, and there are best practices for that, and, and they do differ from doing research on, and, and collecting an oral history is different from collecting a story. Um, or conducting an interview, but there are similar practices that overlap. So it's it's helpful. A lot of those resources are free, um, and then I think you know for probably bringing a consultant in doing something more extensive, you probably want to pay um, yeah. to compensate a, a consultant. I had another question about um, cross-listing courses, mm -hmm. and, and if that's something that may help you get um, both. The drawing in the students, mix, getting a really good mix of students, and also advancing that student on a pathway where they're sort of building something. If, if you can kind of find the right partners on campus to cross list with. Um, cross lists are part of the, you know, the the structure of different campuses, and some do it better than others. And uh, uh, I can only speak to my campus. The the scoring of a course, the credit that the faculty member of the department gets is based on the prefix of the course. And so too much cross-listing makes it look like you're not teaching enough. Um, but not enough cross-listing means your course doesn't fill. And so uh, my course is cross-listed under military and veteran studies and, and uh, sociology and political science. Um, but if I went too much further than you know, the sociology numbers would go down and it would appear that the course, why are you running a course with only 10 students in it? Well, no, there were 25 students, but it doesn't. So it, these are like structural struggles that each institution needs to work through. We have other questions? Should I just... Just shout it out. I'll, I'll just hold this. You can talk. Well, I think the microphone is for the people online, too. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't, it's not really a question as much as a thought that's been bouncing around in my head. And uh, it might make uh, individual institutions uh, you know, combust. But um, thinking, you know, thinking about having a hard time making or getting a good turnout in an individual institution on a veteran studies course. I, I wish there was some way to have some sort of consortium, you know, like yeah. where it, it reached across several different universities. So you pick up 10 at ASU, you pick up 10 at UNSL, you pick up 10 at UC Irvine, something like that. I, I mean, I was kind of thinking of something like, and these didn't work, but those, the massive online courses, mm -hmm. the MOOCs, something like that, I think rather than, you know, locating it specifically in one institution, but it was something that could reach, reach across the entire country. I think it could be a lot more effective, but I have no idea how that would work administratively. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at EKU, we actually have like several different campuses, and one of our campuses, which I, I thought I'd never seen a class done this way until I took um, my veteran studies class. Um, one of our campuses is like two hours away from Richmond in Corbin. And we actually Zoom those students in. And so we get more students that way because we have mm -hmm. students that are in Corbin, which is two hours away um, from Richmond. And I think Mariana said that 
her class now at UCI can enroll students from any UC institution, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, so we weren't making enrollment and so the UC got into the system so that all the other sister schools could take my class, take, take, take a class too. Are they overfilled now? I mean, I have 80 students per year. Oh. Wow. Right. Capacity. Right. Yeah. So we want, and you, yeah. you still get the same per. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm working on that. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get paid more, but well, just, you know, full time job. Maybe steps, maybe steps. Other questions? All right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, we got one. I heard all right. Unless you're clapping for my walk, which I know. <laughs> <laughs> So my my thought immediately heads to yeah, to the, the social work uh, people who do um, military social work military social work uh, programs mostly at the graduate level and they cover militaries and families and kids and trauma and uh, others. Now I, I'm I'm not saying the social work model is the best model for this, but they seem at least at the graduate level seem to have figured out that they can be much more broad than just veteran social work. They do military social work or something like that. Um, but I think it's a great point. Um, and, um, and to the point about refugees, like, so this is a good question. If you have experienced war, uh, are you a veteran? Like if you're a child of, uh, of um, in a war zone, like what the what are the similarities? These are interesting questions. I don't know if that's better studies, but it sure sounds like it's somewhere in the Venn diagram. Bring it another one. But isn't isn't that why we kind of moved to the term military affiliated? Right? It, a lot of campuses instead of using veterans when they talk about veteran yeah. services, they yeah. talk about military affiliated students, so that it encompasses. So the the major reason why we moved, I think campuses used to military affiliates, the post 9-11 GI Bill allows you to transfer your benefits to military connected to your dependents or spouse, and they had to figure out how to do that. So they changed the term, and they sent them to the vet center. Um, in our vet center, the, the dependents, the children of, they don't want to hang out in the vet center. Right? We thought the ROTC kids might, might want to hang out in the vet center, and they don't want to hang out in the vet center. And neither do the vets want the ROTC kids in the vet center. Right. Right. So it, like, it's a very interesting, the term is right, military connected, I think. 
but I, but my sense is it really grew out of a financial model. It's true, but it does have some applicability at the university, right? I mean, it does. Out, outside of a vet center, yeah. the basic programs that support better. Yeah. Right. So if I'm trying to support a veteran that's going to school, and it just so happens that his wife is also going to that school, yeah. right? Employing both of them in that support is incredibly important. Yeah. Right. So I don't know where else to go with it, but I think the military affiliated part is important. Because it, I'm not trying to discount it, but I, I think we cannot underestimate the power of the the federal dollars that create changed an institution the way they consider that. Uh, I, so this just leads me to another question which just popped into my head, so I'm sorry about this. But I, I also think vets could just be considered adult learners, right? And um, often when you rebuild progr programs that you're already really good at for veterans, you might have actually done a disservice because now they seem se feel separated. Right? If you're already, my institution is really good at adult learners. And every time we build something that are vets, it doesn't go very well. So now we just connect. We do a lot of connecting to the stuff we're already doing. Um, Thanks. I'm yeah. taking it back to the earlier question about the veterans and, and those who have experienced war as civilians, as children. Or as, um, and we, you know, we named the program that is about discussions about war and military service aimed at bridging the military-civilian divide, but a lot of, actually a lot of the projects that we were working with, veterans were saying, we're really learning from connecting with refugees in our community oh, yeah. and having these conversations um, yeah. between those who, and some of those refugees may have been um, military-affiliated, they may have been working as translators, or, mm -hmm. but a lot of them are just families and, and civilians who were caught in, and fleeing war, and and I think there's a lot to be learned from it. So we're trying to kind of create a capacious understanding of what dialogues on the experience of war that it's, and military service, so it's not necessarily combat experience yeah. um, for veterans, but it's also not necessarily only veterans who have experienced war, so pulling in those and including those who have experienced war in some other form. And it's a little, it's a bit of an identity crisis because, you know, the words don't quite accommodate um, the, the intention. Am I allowed to ask a, even though I'm up here, am I allowed to ask a quick question? Mm. <laughs> it's a tough I'll one. I'll allow it. All right, so Victoria, uh, four years ago, five years ago, I was on one of the dialogues panels. And my recollection is most of the, pres most of the proposals were about veterans. Mm -hmm. Has that started to shift? Have people started to propose things about other people who are affected by war in other ways? Um, the, the subject matter being met, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, I would say you're right in terms of what they're reading and studying and looking at in terms of the humanity sources. But the, in terms of who is uh, involved or engaged in the programs, um, that's broadened to include that's great. discussion group participants who are refugees, um, discussion mm -hmm. leaders are. Um, so that's where I think I've seen the change more yeah. than the content of what they're reading. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Right. And you could all, people, there, you could experience war in lots of ways, right? right? You could work for a manufacturer, right, who makes things that people use in war, right? That's an experience of war. Yeah. I'm just talking while I'm off the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a really interesting experience where uh, Folks who were recently, recently in concentration camps were actually referred to me hmm. because I work with veterans, and no one knew how who could possibly give these folks therapy. I still don't think I'm particularly qualified, but I mean, to your point, they didn't know who to send them to, so they found someone who works with people who have experienced profound wartime trauma. So I thought that was really interesting. But I wanted to bring up a question and a point. Um, there are a lot of people in health sciences that would love some kind of combined health sciences and veterans health care certificate program. I think that would be a huge draw for a lot of major universities. Um, there are people who have nothing to do with the military or could be spouses or children or uh, veterans themselves who would 
I don't know if they want to work for the VA, but for sure people, you know, want to work with veterans. So obviously, like some kind of veteran certificate program would be like maybe an entry level into the VA, but also that is a huge deal to have going into any hospital system or practice. We, I attempted on several occasions to connect with our local BBA and the B, and the health and the visit the health the hospital to say what do you need from graduates so to make them more valuable to you is there a course that I could build that I could put in the veteran studies program that might make this transaction more visible and it's tough they don't know how to answer that question unless they're like that when I know what Mike does, but there was. I'm not in, in, in VA recruiting, yeah. but I'm pretty sure I get the news feed every day. Yeah. There was just an announcement every, like in the last ten days, the VA just announced it needs to hire some ungodly number of nurses okay. within the next, you know, like, you know thousands, ten thousand, something. Yeah, there are 425,000 VA employees, right? Um, but like, if you're looking for a connection there, it absolutely is hard to find where the button is in the it's end. really it's hard. And I mean, I even yeah. met with the BBA administrator in St. Louis, and she was like, well, I just need I'm people to sure push BBA, paper. VBA, yeah. I don't think so much is the go-to. I mean, the big yeah. dog is the Veterans Health Administration. They have 350,000 of those 425,000 employees. How do you take a nurse, and in the nurse curriculum, for DNA overlap into veteran studies? Yeah. Just It'd be easy. Yeah. Your question. It would be very easy. But I know. Yeah. So um, one of my really close friends, um, Colonel Luna Pro, I recruited her to the University of Colorado when I was there for about five years, and um, together with her leadership, she has a veteran and military healthcare graduate master's program for nurses, as well as a DMP program, and she also works with the PhD students. So. For those nurses who are interested, or if you know nurses that are interested, it's an online program. And it's running through the University of Colorado on the Antruth Medical Campus. And she's done amazing work, um, and she's trying to get competencies to get this accredited, you know, through our, our nursing accreditation yeah. agencies. So if anyone's interested, um, you know, just search University of Colorado College mm. Nursing, and you'll find a whole curriculum of veteran projects. So if, if I could just follow, I mean, I think it's fantastic, and maybe I'm going to go back to the very first couple of paragraphs, which is I'm, I'm, I'm not sure veteran studies is a transactional to a career. Uh, so the veteran services programs are very important, uh, and, and, you know, veteran nursing is super important, but I'm, I'm, I don't know yet if that's what we are. Uh, yeah. And maybe we just haven't been around enough, or we have, don't have enough groundswell telling us what we want to do, uh, what we should be doing uh, to know that yet. Uh, and on that note of uncertainty, yeah. I'm going to wrap us up. Uh, Thank uh, you to the uh, panelists. Yeah.